evening, everyone, and welcome to the, the Book and Author Society's Fall Series. And I'm Kathy Russ. I'm the president of the Book and Author Society. And I am so excited that tonight our guest is Jean Meltzer, author of the, whoops, you can't see it, the matzo ball. Well, you can see it behind Jean. Hi, Jean. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And that music was fabulous. It totally put me in the mood for tonight. I was <laughs> bouncing in my office. It's a shame. Y'all couldn't bounce with me, but <laughs> it's fabulous. I'm so excited. Oh, good. To be good. I'm so glad you liked it. Well, just for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, or for those of you who um, are repeat guests, I'll just give a little background about the Book and Author Society and our mission, um, which is to promote books authors, reading, and literacy, all these things that we all love so much. Everybody who is uh, who is um, participating tonight, these are things that we love. So that's our mission, and we appreciate you joining us tonight and supporting our mission. We used to do luncheons twice a year um, that featured authors. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, we're not able to do that, so we've switched over to virtual events. We're hoping, like the rest of the world, that at some point we'll go back to live events, um, but in the meantime, this is a, a really wonderful opportunity for you to get to know your favorite authors and be able to ask them questions. So we're glad to bring that to you. If you are enjoying the programs, we invite you to sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media. If you're here tonight, you were on our website because you had to register there. Um, but if you want to take that a step further and sign up for the newsletter to see all the great upcoming events, that would be really fantastic. And again, we appreciate your support. We also ask that you support local independent booksellers. And if you wanna buy something online that you um, give bookshop.org a try. Um, there's gonna be a link in the chat if you would like to use it to purchase a copy of the matzo ball. Um, and I hope that you will, cause it's fabulous. Um, and if for some reason um, buying books isn't you know, an option for you right now, please, please, please support your local library um, because they do a great job promoting authors, books and reading as well. If you take our survey after the program tonight, you will be entered into a drawing to win a signed book plate from Jean, and um, we would get that right out to you. So those are um, a, that's a little bit about what we do here at the Book and Author Society. So as far as our event tonight, what I wanna tell you, um, the way that it works is Jean and I are gonna talk for a little while, but we've left plenty of time for your questions. We ask that you put the questions in the Q&A box that should be at the bottom of your screen. You can do it any time throughout, um, throughout the evening. If you have lots of burning questions, you can get started now. Or as Jean and I talk, you can um, type them in, but we've left lots of questions and we'll make sure that you get that time with Jean because you're not here to hear me talk. Um, <laughs> So anyway, about in about a half an hour or so, um, Katie is going to pop in and she's going to field those questions. So that's how it all works. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our special guest this evening, Jean Meltzer, author of The Matzo Ball. How are you, Jean? Good. I'm good. I'm so excited to be here. I've been looking forward to this all day. So I'm very excited. How are you doing? I, You know what? This is absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt, the highlight of my day. I've I, I flew through your book. Oh. I was really surprised it was your your debut novel that, that you have not written a book because it was just so well done. So I guess my first question to you is maybe can you give us some background about yourself and how um how how has your life led you to the point where you wrote the matzo ball? Well, my journey has definitely been circuitous. It wasn't <laughs> like I knew I was gonna the the I even joke, the irony is for most of my life, I always said I wasn't a good enough writer to write a book. Um, so, but, um, but I always knew I was going to be a writer. So I, I can remember writing my first story in kindergarten um, and sort of uh, my whole life in sixth grade, I had a teacher who saw something sort of special in my writing and used to let me read my stories in class. Um, and that really actually kind of solidified that I wanted to be a writer, that first educator, uh, Mrs. Lakuta, uh, in sixth grade English, if you're watching. <laughs> um, and I knew I wanted to, uh, I knew I was good at writing. I knew I was decent at it. It was the only thing I was good at. I couldn't add numbers or uh, anything like that. So I wound up going to school for writing. I went to NYU Tisch. Um, and I knew what I was going to do. I was going to be a TV producer and things like that. 
Um, and that's eventually what happened. I graduated uh, from screenwriting school. I wound up in television. I was very successful, very young. And then I realized I was very unhappy. So I sort of got everything I wanted, which was a successful career in television. I had like within a year, won an Emmy. I had all these employees, but I was very unhappy. Um, and so at that point, I realized I was living for my goals and I was gonna, I decided I needed to live for my values. And that sort of began a spiritual journey for me of returning to my Jewish truths. So at that point, I sort of took a year, began studying, and I realized that I could never learn what I needed to learn in the States. So I quit my job, boarded a plane, and moved to Israel to study. And from there, I went into the rabbinate. Unfortunately, after a few years of study in the rabbinate, uh, my chronic illness, which I had had since 18 worsened, I found myself homebound. Um, and thus, my writing and Jewish journeys combined. And after many, many years of uh, struggling and, and trying to write books, I wrote The Matzah Ball. So in a way, it wasn't really my debut book in the sense of like, it's been this sort of long journey of like writing and television and screenwriting and sort of mismatched journeys in a bit, you know? But the matzo ball is sort of the, where everything kind of came together for me. It was killing well, it. <laughs> and, and it, it. I mean, it, there's so much of you, I think, in this book. You know, Rachel describes herself as a nice Jewish girl. And I saw in your in your author's note at the end, you know, you, you um, describe yourself as a nice Jewish girl. And I have to tell you, one of the things that I absolutely loved was in the author's note at the end, you know, you said about how you weren't sure that a super Jewy book, how it would be received. And, you know, can you talk more about that? Because um, I, I, I confess, I have not read a Jewish <laughs> romance say. before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the, I think, I think too, like, uh, so, so there are Jewish romances out there, but I think what makes Sponsible sort of like unique is that it is, it is so Jewish, the worldview, the language, the, the world that, um, and I think it shows that there's sort of, I think it says a lot about my publisher, the, the courage of sort of doing this type of book. But you have to remember when I, I, well, not remember, but when I wrote this book, I actually never thought it would be published, right? I was at a stage where I was sort of not even trying to be traditionally published. I was writing this book in the middle of the pandemic. I was sort of writing it I was at a stage where I was writing stories for me sort of as part of my healing. So what you're reading is really the Hanukkah romance or the Jewish romance that I wanted to read, right? You're reading my fantasy. You're reading my fan fiction, basically. So for me, I think what I've always found as, so for me, I, I come from a more observant world. Even if my education when I was younger wasn't that good, my worldview is, was still sort of like an observant worldview. And a lot of times I would pick up books or watch shows where they were sort of touted as like Jewish, but it would feel very like, like paper thin. I don't know if that makes sense, but like for me, I didn't feel like my worldview was represented. So that's not a bad thing, right? Because secular experiences are just as valid as more observant experiences in the Jewish family dynamic and spectrum. But for me, I didn't see myself. So again, I never thought the book was gonna be published. So when I was writing it, I was just putting in the things that I would wanna see, what would feel authentic, what would feel um, like fun, what would I wanna like see and be a part of and the fantasy aspect, which I love of romance, which is so big in Christmas tropes. So I think it is amazing that it got published. I think it speaks to where we, I don't think 10 years ago, the matzo ball would have been published. I absolutely don't. But I think we're in this very interesting place in our storytelling where we're starting to make space for these more diverse stories. And I think it's a great, great thing. I am so eager to read stories like the matzo ball from other worldviews, you know, and to, to sort of expand my own worldview in that process. Well, full disclosure for me, um, two of my best friends are Jewish and I always, I get so excited. I've been to Passover Seder and, you know, I've, I'm always asking them questions and, um, you know, so there are some things that I felt familiar, but I learned so much in this book and I, um, you know, just off the top of my head, the food, I just want to eat, you know, I just, I want, I want to go over to, <laughs> 
<laughs> to Toby's house and hate her rugula. <laughs> and rugula. Food is like a huge part of our, like many cultures, but I think especially in Judaism, like when you have, for us, like I always joke, my mom is not a Shabbat dinner maker because I was not raised that way. But I was in a community where Shabbat was part of our weekly observance. And let me tell you, if you think Thanksgiving is a big meal, like you do that Thanksgiving meal every Friday night when you live in an, like an observant Jewish community and you have 20 people crammed around the table and the food, you learn to cook really well and cook really fast. And, but it's just, just this warm, amazing experience. So the food is like part of that. Also Jewish baked goods, I'm not really sure why, but they take forever to make, they're very complicated. So Toby's rugala is, it would be very, very hard and difficult to make, which is why it's hard always to find good Jewish babkas or rugalas. But, but uh, yeah, no, the Jewish food is I think as much about the culture as anything, like a, a lot of cultures. <clears throat> Well, I think too, for me anyway, what it did is it it just set such an atmosphere and tone of home and family and love yeah. and and the caring that the the characters and their families had for each other. And and I think that, you know, Rachel, Rachel says to Jacob, you know, that that basically her mother's mission is to feed everyone who yeah. comes into her house. <laughs> The Jewish way. That's a lot of cultures, I think. You know, and it's, I heard someone recently kind of compare it to, um, what was it, my big fat Greek wedding, that you didn't need to be Greek to sort of understand and be part of like the cultural, like love of that family. That we, we were all Greek watching that movie, right? And I think when I was watching the, when I was writing the matzo ball, I really wanted that feeling. I wanted to invite people into this world I love so much, this community I love. I wanted to showcase the best of my community. That was so important to me. And so I'm so glad to hear you say that, like you felt the warmth, you felt the family mm -hmm. love. Because for me, like, those moments are some of my best moments in Judaism, and I wanted to put them on the page for everybody. Well, and and I really did. I mean, like I'm reading it, and it just it it was a very special book. It was a very special feeling because it came off the page. And I've you know, especially for I think a debut novel, you know, you know how it is. If you read a lot, some books are less successful than others, or you know, some books that try humor, authors that try humor, and and you know, maybe falls a little flat. But I wanted to ask you, like, how did you do it? Because, um, <laughs> because it it was the the feelings that came forth. So, do you attribute that to maybe your, um, you know, your previous career? As, I mean, you've done a lot of writing, so you're not new to writing, um, you know. So not stilted or or you know trying too hard or anything. But like, what's where'd the magic come from? <laughs> you know, it sounds crazy, perhaps, but I think it. Can, I think the fact is that chronic illness has robbed a lot from me, stolen a lot. And so because of that, I don't really have much to lose. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, so I'm not really embarrassed at this. I'm not afraid of being laughed at. I'm not afraid of failing. I'm not afraid because I've already lost so much and I spent 10 years sort of invisible, right? And that's not like I'm, I'm homebound, I'm disabled. Before the matzo ball, like, Nobody cared about my day to day, right? Nobody cared at all. So for me, there's there's almost a freedom in like losing everything, right? And I, I made me that freedom that not caring what other people think at this stage is part of sort of uh, what you're seeing on the page, right? That there's a, I wouldn't even call it confidence. It's It's that there's nothing to lose so I can just be honest. I'm okay with being honest because I've already been through so much. I don't know if that makes sense, but <laughs> well, you're you're gonna go for it. You're gonna right, go for exactly. it and just and just put put out whatever you want to put out there because you don't right. have anything to lose. Right. So yeah. <laughs> One of the things that um really got to me and spoke to me that that I I um I I did some research on chronic fatigue syndrome as a result of this book, oh, but the, the quote, it's on page 12 about, um, you know, calling, calling, and I, I hope I, I um, 
I want to say it right, myalgic encephalomyelitis. I can barely say it right. So <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying it for years and I was still like, I'm like myalgic encephalomyelitis. Yes, it's 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 a mouthy word. And, and we usually just say ME and I don't know if anyone can pronounce it correctly. Um, ME, CFS, CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, yeah. But I, 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 you know, so, but the quote was, it's like calling, chronic fatigue syndrome is like calling someone with Alzheimer's senior moment syndrome. And I thought, I mean, that really smacked me between the eyes because I thought, you know, you wouldn't do that to Alzheimer's. I mean, you absolutely would not say that, but to, to chronic fatigue syndrome, it just is such a minimizing of, yes. of what the people who are suffering absolutely. From it are going through. Um, and it's such a, a mysterious illness. And I read too, that they're, um, they're now, um, there's another term for it, or they're, they're calling it maybe um, systemic exertional intolerance yeah. disease. Yeah, that was at one point IOM had come in and, and wanted to rename it based on this idea of the PEM, the post-exertional uh, malaise. But yeah, there's a whole sordid history behind chronic fatigue syndrome and why it has that name. And unfortunately, a big part of that comes out of the fact that it mainly afflicted women. Mm -hmm. And because it mainly afflicted women, it also developed around the same time HIV AIDS um, was, being, was occurring. But there was a real fear about disability and paying out insurance. And of course, they sent down someone from like the CDC or NIH, and this was the name they came up with. And it was absolutely a way to sort of minimize what, what these people were going through. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of um, uh, not even missteps, just outright, you know, funding has been misappropriated. Um, the name has done what it was set out to do, which was that it has affected us for 40, 50 years in terms of research, in terms of being taught in medical schools, in terms of getting care. There is not one drug approved for the treatment of MECFS. That includes symptoms. So at any point, an insurance company can deny me, me medication, can deny me care at any point. These are really real issues that stem from the fact that CFS from the beginning has been discredited. And that name is not doing us any favors, unfortunately. No, and it seems too, you know, if there's no official approved medication, your alternative is what? Tons and tons and tons of caffeine and stimulants. And yes, that's not basically. a good. Yes, basically stimulants and then things to manage pain, things to manage sleep. But mainly like most chronic illnesses, I don't think I'm alone in this. What you find is that you're kind of left to, to manage on your own. And unfortunately, I've been sick 20 years now. So I have more than one chronic illness. So I know that most of my diseases, you get a pill, right? And they send you on your way, but on your day-to-day, -day, you're sort of left to manage on your own. And so that that's really, and that includes like, if you need to be on disability, if you need um, accommodations, whatever you are, it's, there's no team that comes in and rescues you. And yeah. I think that's, what's really like kind of surprising when people get ill is just how much the medical system kind of fails you, that it's not an in and out, that there's not an easy cure. But that being said, you know, I guess the hopeful part of this is that like, my story is that it's not all bad, right? Like, like I've had good days and bad days and I'm, I'm making it work, but it definitely is a, it is a challenge to live with chronic illness. And it's not alone to CFS, it's hypothyroid, thyroid disease, lupus, Lyme, fibromyalgia. I mean, there are a lot of diseases that if you look at them, especially when they afflict women, right, they have a stigma attached to them. And that that needs to stop. And the way we stop that is we talk about it. Mm -hmm. So have you heard from um, other MECFS sufferers um, and as a result of the matzo ball? Yes, I have. And the, like, I mean, it. so many people have reached out caregivers, people with MECFS, partners, parents, who have said that just like to have a book where there's a character with MECFS, but it's a hopeful book and it's yeah. a happy book is like, it's unbelievable, right? And so what most people also don't know is when I was first diagnosed, I, re I was very ashamed of my diagnosis because of the stigma and I was so sick and I didn't have a way to make sense of like how I could be this sick with this stupid name and that I was gonna live my entire life like this. I was 18, 19. And I remember Laura Hillenbrand at the very same time came out with Sea Biscuit and did that New York Times article where she said, I have CFS and I've been homebound. 
And so when I knew the book was going to be published, I felt like it was my way of paying it back because seeing Laura Hillenbrand talk about her disease when I was sort of in the closet with my disease and so scared was so important. And so to me, like having hope and moving forward. So I guess I'm paying it forward now doing the same thing. And God willing, 20 years from now, we'll have more treatments and a cure that someone won't need to do this again. But, you know, I think that's why I'm even more of an advocate about it because, because it was so important to see a woman being successful with a chronic illness. Well, that, that I think brings me to Rachel. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about the book. Um, so Rachel, I, she's, she's delightful, but she's sort of, um, two people or not two people, but she has different sides to her personality. Um, so, cause she's hiding. Um, she loves Christmas and she is a Christmas I'm romance now. novelist. <laughs> yes. And so, <laughs> so um, unleash your inner like, Rachel. <laughs> my inner Rachel. I slept with this for two months when I got it. I carried it around like a binky, refusing to give it up. This is Jewish Santa. I, I love him. This was once my collection. Yes, there's a lot of, me and Rachel share a lot of similarities. And yes, she's a quirky, I guess I'm quirky, so she's quirky. I think all my characters have come to realize are quirky. I've lived in this house a very long time. I will admit it. <laughs> okay, I don't get out much. I'm homebound, you know. So the quirkiness that like maybe she comes across with is probably like, you know, I, I hold on to my joy, right? So like one of the things I love is to laugh. You know, you have to laugh, especially if you're homebound or having a bad day. Like, so yeah, this, this, this gives me such joy because literally I didn't make it this way. It came this way. It's, I mean, who would make this? This is brilliant. So yeah, there's a lot, but also like I've always loved Christmas and um, I wasn't allowed to celebrate Christmas like Rachel. And uh, my mom did rip down my green construction paper Christmas tree when I was a little girl. And my mom did march into school every time we were singing Christmas carols and start a petition. And <laughs> So it was every year, Judah Maccabee versus the Santa Claus. And, um, you know, uh, finally in my 30s, I was married. I was independent. I was in Coles one day. I saw this little silver tree and I was like, <laughs> I brought it home with the ornaments. I brought it home, I plugged it in my apartment. I was like, oh, and then the first thing I did was I hid it in my Christmas office and I put it in my office to hide it from my mom. And after a few years, the collection kind of just grew and grew. And I sort of came to terms with my love of like Hanukkah, Christmas ornaments. And uh, now it's just something I do every year. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of me and Rachel share similarities in that regard. So I have to ask you because of what you said, because for people who have read the book, you'll understand this. But if you haven't, it's one of the coolest parts of the book. But did you have a Christmas office? I do. I did. Yes, I absolutely did. Especially like before. I think that's where it came from, because <laughs> I, I was writing. I would put out all this like like Hanukkah decor. There was more than this. It's all been moved out a little bit now. Um, and yeah, I did. I had. A and I was talking to my mom about it recently, and I think it was because she was a doctor, and she would have, she's a doctor, of course, like Dr. Rubenstein, and uh, not, a, not a fertility specialist, but she would, during the holidays, she would actually have a small Christmas tree and a menorah in her office. So I think in the back of my mind, I felt like if I put it in my office, it was okay. Like, it wasn't like it was in my house, but it became the Christmas, yes, it became the, the, the Christmas office, but you know, I guess we grow up, but we always stay the same a little bit. And I really love my parents and they've come, they totally get my Hanukkah decor. Now we were on a Zoom thing last year and they were like, let us see your outside lights. So like, you know, it, it, we're, we've all come to a piece, piece with my, my weird Christmas Hanukkah obsession. But yeah, yeah, I had a Christmas office. Absolutely. Well, and, I but I think that's what's so endearing about Rachel because she is quirky, but she's fun and she cares very much about her friends and her family. Um, but she's a, maybe a little bit afraid of her identity or of who she is or to, to just be so completely herself. Yeah. And especially with her arch nemesis from Jewish summer camp, Jacob, who I think is like, if, if I had to create 
uh, uh, you know, the, 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 I mean, he's wealthy, he's gorgeous, he's nice, he's funny, he's kind, he's like everything. So where'd he come from? He's a man. Um, you know, I always say like, um, there's a lot of my husband and Jacob and one of the, there's two things that I would say, which is that my husband is just such a strong person and that he doesn't care at all what other people think. Um, and two, that he really, and is bonafide, he is like the best human being I've ever met. He's a really good soul. And that's why I fell in love with him. And when I was writing Jacob, you know, I got married at 30, so I dated a lot, a lot. All of Jewish men happened before I got married. <laughs> All of it, the entirety, the entirety, man do I have stories. But, um, so, but what attracted me to my husband wasn't like his, his bank account or if he was, he wasn't, he wasn't successful. Oh, he was a broke college kid living in his mama's basement, about to deploy to Iraq. Um, he wasn't Jewish, it was all complicated, but he had such a good heart. And so, you know, that was it for me. And so I think what I kept trying to do with Jacob was just try to make it that he had such a good heart. He's not perfect, he makes mistakes, he's, he's awkward and broken in the way like Rachel is, but he has such a good heart. I I just, he, he really does. And the way that the two of them, um, you know, kind of work it all out, um, is, is, you know, cause there are a couple of times I'm like, well, it's a romance. It has to have a happy ending. You know, you're kind of not sure what then they do, but I see Katie here. We have an absolute ton of questions. So, um, and we want to make sure we get to answer them all. So Katie, take it away. Hello. I've enjoyed listening to you all talk and I'm sorry, my background is going crazy. Like if something didn't break, it wouldn't be a zoom session. Right. So, um, <laughs> First of all, Jean, I have to tell you, and I hope you will take this for the compliment that this is, um, I started a PhD program this fall, and yours is probably the only nonfiction or fiction book that I finished because it was absolutely the perfect mindless read that I needed. So thank Good. you for that. Good. You are most <laughs> welcome. That is the, like, it should be enjoyable. You know, they, yes. we, we have become a society where we underrate joy. So we absolutely smile, feel good, live in the fantasy I always joke about romance. I am here for the billionaire who does laundry. <laughs> I don't want anything else. Just come over and do my laundry and be rich and hot while you do it. And we that's it. That's Absolutely. my romance. <laughs> Absolutely. That's it. <laughs> so let's talk about that rich and hot part because we have several comments <laughs> here about people are like, this needs to be a movie. Uh -huh. So who would you pick to play Rachel and Jacob? You know, I have no idea because I actually don't know celebrities at all. Like, I'm really, really bad at this, that if I was like sitting next to a famous person, I would not know it for a second. Like, I am, I can't even begin to fathom because like an, a name because I just don't really know anybody, especially, especially the new youngin ones, you know, so so I'd have to leave it up to people who are much better than, than I am. Who would put you it, guys pick? Put I'm it in your curious. contract that you need yeah. to be part of the casting yeah. or something. <laughs> I think my husband wants that in the contract. He's like, <laughs> me. I want to be in every film. <laughs> I, I, that was a question I was going to ask because I agree a billion percent. This is a book that is just crying out to be a, a, a movie. And I would go see it like a thousand times and oh. cry probably with happiness <laughs> every time because it's just so, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, I saw Liam sure. Bialik 10, 20 years oh, ago. Yeah. Maybe. About 20, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't know about Jacob. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's hard, it's right? One. That's and, a tough and also one. In my head, the you know, because they're your babies, they look a certain way, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's hard to imagine like another actor or actress that doesn't quite look like them playing them or putting their own spin on it but you know, so we'll see. Sarah actually is wondering too would you want to go back to screenwriting maybe help with the screenplay for this book if that were to happen I mean probably I guess I'm assuming I mean I think you can take the girl out of film school but you probably can't <laughs> I mean I think the book you can see that there's so much film background in it right like, yes um and it's funny because someone asked recently and they were like 
well, when did you know you could write a book or you would attempt it? And I actually talked about reading Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games, mm. which you would never know because of like, it's a, I'm a romance writer. But that was the first time I really read a book. And I was like, oh, this is a movie. Like, I was like, she's using three act structure. She's using all the ve- visual elements of beats. And that was the moment where I went from like, I can never write a book to I can write a book. So, uh, yeah, if I'm still doing all the film stuff all these years later, it's because um, I guess deep down inside, I love a good visual read. I love that. A visual read. That's so that's such a great phrasing. Um, So we have Susan in the comments who is a retired teacher. She said she loves it that you, um, you know, that you mentioned the teacher who encouraged you. Her question is, were you a reader as a child and what authors inspired you growing up? And I would add, um, who are you also reading now? Sure. So I used to love, so I was very much a kind of like latchkey kid and I would just spend all afternoon when I was in Hebrew school uh, going to the uh, library and just sort of going through all the books. I, weirdly enough, I... I, I, talk, I haven't ever said this before, so this will be the first time I ever talk about it, but I loved Asian American literature as a kid, and it wasn't like it is now. I remember I would have to wait for like a Lisa C. book to come out or an yes. Amy Tan book to come out. I would have to wait, right? And I think for me, it was um, a place where I saw, where a lot, even though it wasn't my cultural experience, I felt very similar because it dealt a lot of times with themes of being silent or not feeling like you had a voice or issues of being a woman in a certain culture. And I very much related to that. So, so it sounds like a weird kind of answer. I'm sure you've never heard that before, but like for me, that was, those, I love, I must have, I, to this day, it's still one of my favorite like genres. I read all of it. Um, and who am I reading right now? Obviously, I read a ton of rom-com. Um, I'm reading As Seen on TV by Meredith Shore, which is an arc, which is coming out next year, which is fabulous. It's really happy. It's giving me all the feels. Um, and obviously, uh, I just love Jenny Bayless, I think is so talented. She's a Christmas, uh, she's been doing a lot of Christmas romances. Talia Hibbert, um, Christina Lauren, I mean, like, you know, Emily Henry, all the big romance names uh, I'm a big fan of. Um, who else? And Liz Bowery, I read, who's coming out in the next year as well. I thought she, her book was amazing. So, I mean, there's way too many. Oh, and Debbie Maycomer, of course, and Brenda Novak. And I mean, I just love them all. I love every book for different reasons. It's yes. like for, you come to it different every time and it changes you every time. So, I could go on. Well, you're, you're speaking to the librarian choir right. here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I know my grandmother is on this call and she adores Lisa C. So I'm sure she was happy to hear that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, uh, I some of my favorite books. Great author. So, yeah. so um, Cindy says, I just love the character of Mickey, which I would absolutely second that. Mickey is phenomenal. Uh, do you have a real Mickey of your own? I do have a real Mickey. Um, when I was writing that character, I was absolutely just channeling my love for my best friend. So Mickey absolutely exists. One day, we the, the Hamptons joke is a real joke that we were going to go off. And Mickey, my Mickey is single and I am looking still. So for um, I absolutely have a Mickey and he's the most amazing human being in the world. And um, yeah. And I, I have, it's kind of a compilation him, of him and another friend. And, um, but all of that is real. I mean, all the characters in the books are like bits and pieces of my life. And everybody should have, I mean, I've been very lucky to be blessed with such good friendships and relationships. Yeah. And I think I echo Kathy, you know, the, the family and the friends and the love, it really came through mm-hmm. in the book for sure. Very warm. Um, let's talk about Jewish summer camp. <laughs> so did you go to a Jewish camp like Camp Bahava? And I hope, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, if so, how did it influence you or were you jealous of the kids that went to Jewish camp because you couldn't go or something? What, tell us about that. So I always went to Jewish camps. Um, I, however, I went to what was a, like a JCC day camp for most of my life. But I did spend one summer at Camp Ramah in the Berkshires, which is a uh, more observant religious sort of camp. And I like a lot of people in the conservative community 
I did what was called USY, United Synagogue Youth and things like that. So I think Mott Jacob, how he talks about sort of being on the more secular end and then being sort of thrust into this world with more observant kids, that is absolutely my experience. And then having been in rabbinical school and then becoming one of these like more educated Jews and living in this world, that is Rachel's experience, right? So I, for me, I was fascinated. I've always, I guess I've always been fascinated by sort of this kind of like barrier to entrance in Judaism, right? And that, you know, how we connect and that there's these two very different worlds. But yes, I went to Jewish summer camp, um, USY, JCC. Um, I didn't, I did have my first kiss at summer camp, but it was not a Jewish summer camp. Um, and it was in the summer going into the seventh grade. It was a summer institute for the gifted. Um, his name was Luke. That's all I'll say. He was Italian. <laughs> I have to ask you, because one of the things that I was like, oh man, I want to go to Jewish summer camp, but do they really teach how to rewire a lamp? Um, they, yes, you take all sorts of like useless, like, I can't believe that you've never like, not rewire, but like put in the wire to the lamp. Yeah, like, so you take like, depending on the camp you go to, like there's courses, right? So you'll have like a sewing class, you'll have like cooking class. Like I learned how to make a pillow at Camp Rama. I still know how to make a pillow from my days at Camp Rama. Um, like, uh, and also, yeah, like there'll be like a mechanical, whatever, engineering class. They'll hire like local people. I mean, you learn a lot of useless stuff. So it'll be, that's, yeah. <laughs> they keep you entertained and ropes courses. And, um, and Jewish camp has the added stuff of they're trying to teach you all the Jewish stuff with it. So like there's, you know, all the values and the lessons and the lake, but all of that, even like the lake in the book and the two sides, that's, that was definitely Camp Rama, like in my head a bit. Yeah. We had a couple of people call that out. They recognized that camp and suspected that. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, so your book is very lighthearted. It's very fun, but there's some serious sides to it too. So that's kind of where the questions are trending now. Mm -hmm. A couple serious questions. Um, Susan wants to know, uh, does CFS, ME, and other chronic illnesses, do they affect adults only? At what age do most people show symptoms? I think, you know, this is such a hidden thing. Like you said, most people don't know much about it. So absolutely, it does not only affect adults. Uh, in fact, I have met many parents of children who mm -hmm. are who are not just sick, but cannot leave their bedrooms. They're completely mm -hmm. bedridden. Um, so that's a side of it that never gets, you never hear about. Mm -hmm. uh, it affects men. Um, there's So the only thing they know for certain is that there is a correlation between development of EBV or mono uh, in adolescence and developing CFS later on. So I developed EBV mono, and about a year later, I developed CFS, um, which is not totally unusual. We've seen that with long COVID, right? That mm -hmm. people get a virus, and then their body doesn't quite reset, right? And then they develop uh, something else, or Lyme disease becoming long-term Lyme, right? So it's not totally unusual. Um, but yeah, it can affect all ages. It does. Some of the studies say women uh, mainly in their like 30s, 40s. So it follows like a pattern of autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. However, because we're so underfunded, I would really, really hesitate to quote that as a exact science mm -hmm. because unfortunately, you know, minorities are not diagnosed as much as white women, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an issue. Um, men might be misdiagnosed. If you have comorbid conditions, you might be misdiagnosed. So uh, it, I don't want to, the only thing they know for certain is there's a correlation between EBV mono and development of CFS. Is there a foundation or something out there that you would recommend to our listeners? Absolutely. There's three great organizations with great science and doing great work. Uh, ME Action is a grassroots advocacy organization. That's the hashtag, ME Action. <laughs> Solve MECFS, so just the word solve MECFS, and then uh, also OMF, Open Medicine Foundation. They're doing great international research between mm -hmm. Harvard, Stanford, and uh, the, the UK and Europe, and a lot of great research coming out of there. So, ME Action, Solve MECFS, and OMF are great places to learn more. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, now, Debbie wants to know uh, whether, like in the book, your family has Holocaust survivors and how that has played a role in your life. I'm sure it plays a role in any Jewish person's life. Yes. So uh, my family is not a direct uh, descendant. However, uh, my mother, so complicated, long story. Basically, uh, my mother's brother had cerebral palsy. You'll see I do a shout out about Paul in the book and things like that to my uncle Philip. And when uh, they were growing up, uh, his aide or the boy who took care of him was a Holocaust survivor. He was a teenager who had, who had survived. His name was Gus. He was very influential in my mother's life to the point where at one summer she almost drowned in a pool and Gus jumped in uh, and saved her life. Oh, wow. So I grew up with Gus and the story of Gus and Gus had this incredible story and a lot of Toby um, is based on Gus um, and Gus's story because of um, he was a German boy. He was blonde hair and blue eyes. He was placed on a train by his mother. Uh, he survived in France, hiding and working in the revolution, uh, the resistance movement, excuse me. He had been stabbed at one point uh, mm -hmm. and left to die, but he had survived. And I, this is the thing about Gus. He was, despite having gone through all this, losing his family, having, he was the most beautiful soul you would have ever met in your entire, he was, you know, those people who walk in a room and the whole room just like lights up with them. He was like that, an incredible human being. So a little bit of Toby is inspired by Gus and that story. And then another part is uh, one of my Makatum and my extended family was this incredible woman named Mildred who lived to like 104 years old and would always drink like gin rubbies at night and was just a fabulous, fabulous woman. And um, I just, I guess they were sort of, when I was writing Toby, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think I was taking bits and pieces of like Gus and Mildred and other elderly sort of amazing octogenarians that I had met in my journey. So yeah, like they're they're real. And also just that these, just like my uncle who had CP, even though they had all these difficulties in their life and these challenges and these traumas, they were just loving, wonderful people. And the realization that we always can choose to be good, loving, better people no matter what happens to us. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, Debbie said, thank you for that answer. And she said, that's another story. So clearly <laughs> it's a lot, I lot wish, of stories. I wish I could spend, like, tell more of like yeah. the true stories because I have such love for these people and love for these experiences. And I guess that's in the matzo ball. And maybe that's why it comes to the original question. How did you write it so hard for me? But yes. that's why, because it's from a real place, you know? I love it. Um, Cindy wants to know where she can purchase your next book, Mr. Perfect on paper. Anywhere, everywhere. Bookshop.org. You can go to any of your favorite indies and support them. And I'm sure at some point we'll be doing a pre-order campaign, but this is, when is that's paper. coming out when August, August 20, 22 already. Nice. 20, 22. So a few more months and it'll be here. Excellent. And what is next after that? So I, it's in development and we'll see, we'll see what happens, but I think I want to continue sort of, again, it's going to be a Jewish romance, a Jewish rom-com, but I really, I think I, I've mentioned a little bit that I was in the last year or two di uh, diagnosed with IC, interstitial cystitis. And so I really want to write a book that sort of explores baked goods, pelvic pain, and intimacy. And so that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> I think you've got a title there. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, that's, that's amazing. I, you know, I was curious because Kathy had sort of asked you about, you know, had you heard from the Emmy community on your book? Have you, have you heard from the Jewish committee? I mean, you've, you've touched so many different communities in your book, which I think is amazing just to really, to have all these different stories coming together. Have you heard bits and pieces from each of the communities that you include? Yeah, I absolutely have. And I've, I'm really like, I'm, I've been so amazed and touched because I really wasn't sure how like the Jewish world would react to like this book, but like they've been so wonderful and, and kind and open hearted. And like, clearly there was like a real hunger for just like a joyous sort of like Jewish 
you know, and again, not that like this is the first time anyone's attempted or anything like that, but like I just the I think publicity around it, just that they can go into a Barnes and Noble and the you know pick up the book and it's there. I think meant a lot to people. And same thing with CFS that a a book with a character that has CFS would be sitting on a table at Barnes and Nobles is it's it's unbelievable for us, right? It's for for you know twenty years ago they were still making jokes about it being yuppie flu and that we're malingerers and things like that. So now that we have a book where our story is being told, I think, yeah, the emails I get, they, they, I say this all the time, but like, it makes every hard day worth it. Every yeah. hard day worth it. That's amazing. I love that representation. And I love that you're hearing from that community. That's fantastic. Um, let's see, let me check my other, we are out of questions from the community um but so i will hand it actually back over to kathy but thank you so very much thank it's been you. a pleasure thank you so you know katie meant or you and gene i'm sorry you mentioned you know so you know people can go into barnes and noble and they can see this and the cover i think the cover is is if i say beautiful it's it's um it invites you in and I, what i also was drawn to is rachel is depicted she's not um she's in the book she's um she's got curves you know she's not heavy but she's got curves and they they put that on the cover and yeah. i love that yeah. because she's not skinny skinny or you know or, or appearing sick or anything like that she is represented truthfully so did yeah. you have any input into the cover um they they absolutely check with you and things like that um but i thought they just did an amazing, amazing job on it. I mean, this was really, even like the fact that she's seated and he's standing when she has CFS, I thought was like such a beautiful, like little choice. Um, but no, there was really, this was like uh, Gigi Lauz, uh, who's uh, the art director, I believe at Harlequin. Um, this was her first sort of go at it. And everybody was like, that's amazing. And that yeah. was, it was, it wasn't something that had to be reworked, reworked. It was, it was just beautiful. And I mean, again, credit to them that they also like really made it a on this cover that you can tell it's like a Jewish story. You know, I think that was very courageous of them. You don't often see a Jewish star on a book if it's not like a Holocaust yeah. book, you know. Yeah. So, so, you know, I thought it was very it's a great cover and I'm very happy with it. They did a wonderful job. <clears throat> I, so the title, so the matzo ball. So I looked it up online, and there's something called the. It's it's a different spelling, but and it, and it's a and it's a ball for Jewish singles. But like, where did the idea when? So when you're thinking about this book, and and you have your characters, because I, I, where I'm going with this is the no, the scenes in the book, especially the 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 denouement, if I can use that word. But like, you know, Rachel's climbing up a fire escape and it's so visual. And I can see the movie and there's this giant menorah mm -hmm. and the spotlights on them. And I was like, I want to go to that. I so know. How did that all come together in your mind? So so when I was writing the Matzo Ball, it was very important to me that even though I was going to take all the tropes of like a typical Christmas romance, like a Hallmark movie, that it feel authentic to the Jewish experience. And this is kind of one of the jokes of the book. How do you do that, right? We don't have baking competitions around Hanukkah. This is not real, right? We don't have ha Hanukkah town. Like there's no place where you go, maybe Jerusalem, but like where it's all, you know, Hanukkah menorahs lighting up the street. It doesn't exist in America. So how could I take something that was Hanukkah-ish, right? That's real, that if I was a Jewish person picking up the book, that it, it would feel authentic. And matzo balls are real events. Any Jewish person who ever lived in a city, a matzo ball, outside of the fact that it comes from the food, is was started 50, 60 years ago as a way to be a singles event for Jewish people on Christmas Eve when all their friends were off celebrating. So I had I knew I wanted to take all these things from Jewish culture to make it feel authentic. And the way I could sort of align it to Hanukkah was through a real event, just like there are, I guess, Christmas cookie competitions and cooking competitions and places that go all out for Christmas, right? We actually have matzo balls. So it was a way to make it feel authentic. Um, and if there were other Hanukkah things that could feel more authentic, I think maybe I would 
have used those. But for me, it came down to like, I wanted a Jewish person to feel like, to not have sort of roll their eyes and be like, oh, there's no such thing as a Hanukkah town. Come on now. Like, <laughs> right. So that was, that was my instinct. Oh, no, that was great. I want to switch gears a little bit because I know um, you mentioned it before um, Katie had it uh, brought it up in one of the questions, but um, Mr. Perfect on paper, can you tell us a little bit about what that's about? Yes. Um, so I'm so proud of Mr. Perfect on paper. This was a super hard book to write, but basically it's about a third generation Shabchanit or matchmaker named Dara Rabinowitz, who finds her a private um, search for love uh, going public when her bubby sort of shares her list for the perfect Jewish husband on national television. And as this sort of nationwide hunt ensues, um, she finds herself more and more drawn to Christopher Steadfast, the charming and totally not Jewish reporter following her story. And so I always say on the surface, it's an interfaith romance, but um, really to quote a Yiddishism, it's about how man plans and God laughs. And again, it's inspired by my own love story, which was that I was like a deeply committed Jewish rabbinical student when I fell in love with my husband who was at the time not Jewish. And again, I wanted to write an interfaith romance, but I really wanted to write it from like sort of the Jewish worldview, which was like what it means to be sort of stuck in a place between your two hearts, your faith, your family, and someone you care about and how you negotiate that. Well, it, it, I, I can't wait to read it because yeah. as Katie said too, um, one of the things that I appreciated about this book, I have, I read a lot of um, books for book clubs and I enjoy them and I love to talk at, you know, to, to, to do book clubs, to talk about books, but the matzo ball was like a, a palate cleanser. Mm. You know, I had read Northern Spy about the IRA and mm. I was like, I can't wait to read this book <sighs> because it was just, um, it was and and this, as I said, the spirit was so beautiful. And I, you know, there there was a lot of substance, but it didn't make me. It it brought me up, not down. Yeah. So I really want to thank you for that. Oh no, that that's exactly. I mean, for me, like, I wrote this in the middle of the pandemic. I wrote it like it was my way of like holding on to my joy at a time that was so dark. And that's something I've done my whole life. And like, so to hear that it gives other people joy, like, don't, it's not a book. Yes, there are serious things in it, and I hope you walk away learning something about mm -hmm. Judaism or CFS, because I like reading a book and learning something, but it's meant to be a fun book. It's not meant to be taken like a literary masterpiece. I am fine saying that. Like, it is meant, it is okay to just have fun, and so I hope, I'm glad to hear you had fun. Like, if that's oh. all, if that's all it did for you, just like made you feel great and fluffy and good awesome. Then, then, then I put good karma into the universe and I will take it. So, <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I want you to come back if you would, when, um, when Mr. Would, Perfect on paper I would comes love out. To, I would absolutely love to. This has been so wonderful. You guys are so wonderful. So oh, we're I, just delighted to talk to you. And, and the other thing too, and, and I want, um, so when you come back, you can tell the Jewish dating stories. <laughs> oh my gosh. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> like, like an extra half like, hour no no like because like, I would be like oh girl let me tell you let me tell you what this is based on <laughs> let me tell you I well, mean, hopefully lots of material for many more books to come you have no idea it was it was my mother was like when we were talking about the second book and she was like you dated so many horrible men. Remember that <laughs> psychopath from Florida? And I was like, thanks, mom. <laughs> I remember him. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I don't, I don't want to end, but we will, um, we'll, we'll wrap, start wrapping up so we don't take more of your time, but please, please, please do come back. And I would see love us. to, I would love to come back. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you everybody for reading and for letting me be here and just letting me tell my story. It's been amazing. Oh, well, it just, everybody, if you want, um, if, if you're looking for, I want to make sure that the screen doesn't take it away. There it is. And you can see it behind Jean. It's a fantastic book. It's great. For you, it's great. If you know somebody who's maybe going through a little bit of a rough time, fabulous gift. And just um, if you want to put some, to, to, to 
read something that brings you joy. I really encourage you to read the matzo ball because it sure will. And you will see the movie in your head and then you will want to go see that movie on screen. So, <laughs> so you have to keep us posted about that too, if anything comes from that. So, all right. Well, I want to thank you, Jean. And um, I want to thank all of our audience for joining us. I want to let you know that on December 6th, we are going to be talking to Mallory O'Mara, who wrote the book Girly Drinks. It is a history, a world history of women and alcohol. Um, so it's it's nonfiction. Um, it's not a funny title for a, another romantic book. Um, and um, so we'll be talking to her um, on December 6th. In the meantime, if you would like to get your copy of The Matzo Ball, bookshop.org, your local independent bookseller, your local library, and don't forget to take our survey so you can um, so you can receive a, a signed book plate from Jean. So that's what we have going on. And I want to wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving and a very happy Hanukkah because that starts on that's Sunday, good. November 28th. That's yes. good. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Anything happy you want Hanukkah. to say, Jean? Just it, thank you so much. Happy holidays. May you have all the joy, health, and blessing in the new year. Happy Thanksgiving. And thank you. Thank you, Book and Author Society. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you guys. And I hope you love the book. And thank you for having me. Right back at you. Big hug. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll say uh, we'll wave goodbye. That's right. That's right. <laughs> bring, bring it home, Hanukkah Santa. <laughs> bring it home. La, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> have a wonderful evening everybody and thanks again for joining us we'll see you next time bye